Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining our webinar. My name is Patty Tanasia, and I'm one of the genetic counselors here at Illumina. It is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker. Dr. Tina Zianya is an obstetrician gynecologist in San Diego, California, who has been in practice for more than 17 years. She is affiliated with Sharp Memorial Hospital and Sharp Mary Birch Hospital for Women and Newborns, the largest freestanding women's hospital in the Western United States with over 9,000 deliveries in 2016. Dr. Zianya completed her undergraduate work at the University of Houston. She earned her Doctor of Medicine degree at the University of Texas Medical Branch in Galveston. Because of her passion for women's health, Dr. Zianya pursued an internship in residency in obstetrics and gynecology in St. Louis, Missouri. Her professors were so enamored with her that they recruited her to stay on as faculty for several years before she left academics to join a private practice medicine group in San Diego. Dr. Zania has been a member of the OBGYN department of the Sharp Lee Sealy Medical Group since 2006. She has been offering non-invasive prenatal testing to patients since 2013. In addition to her busy clinical practice, Dr. Zania volunteers in her daughter's kindergarten class and is actively involved with humanitarian work helping families of newborns. Dr. Zania, thank you for being here. Thank you very much, Patty, for that lovely introduction. Okay, let's begin. Here's an image of my hospital, Sharp Mary Birch Hospital for Women and Newborns. This hospital opened up in 1992 to serve the San Diego community. Um, now we're doing over 9,000 deliveries, as Patty mentioned. I've been working with Sharp Race Daily for, um, since 2006, and it's a multi-specialty um, 500 provider group of every specialty, and there are 20 board-certified obstetrician gynecologists in this group, and we do about 3,800, over 3,800, someone's close to 4,000 of these 9,000 deliveries per year. So here are my disclaimers and disclosures. What I'd like to point out today is the opinions expressed today in this webinar are my opinions and may not represent the opinions of Illumina. Also, um, the main focus of our talk is non-invasive prenatal testing, and this is a screening exam, not diagnostic, and we'll talk about this further on during the lecture. So let's have an overview of what our agenda is going to be today. We're going to have an overview of prenatal aneuploidy screening and diagnostic options. We're going to also review the most current prenatal aneuploidy screening guidelines. Um, I'm going to talk about personal implementation of NIPT into a vi very busy obstetrics practice. And we're going to identify some resources for education and reimbursement for both providers and patients. So let's begin. Let's do our overview. We're going to talk now about prenatal screening and testing options. Birth defects, rates and causes in live births. Luckily for the patients, our patients and the physicians, 95 to 97 percent of all babies are born healthy without any birth defects. Of the 3 to 4 percent of babies born with birth defects, 10 to 15 percent of these are chromosomal abnormalities known as aneuploidy. What can affect this? As we know, maternal age, previous affected pregnancy, parental translocation, and so on. Pre other abnormalities, such as prenatal exposure, constitute a small percentage also. We have single gene, multifactorial, and unknown. Today we're going to focus in on the 10 to 15 percent of chromosomal abnormalities, which is known as aneuploidy, and how best to test for that. So let's look at the prenatal prevalence of reported chromosomal abnormalities. The major fetal aneuploidies are trisomy 21, trisomy 18, trisomy 13, monosomy X is known as Turner syndrome, sex trisomy, and other rare. Maternal serum screening, what we typically do now, only screens for about 66 to 71 percent of abnormalities seen in pregnancy. Non-invasive prenatal testing, known as NIPT, screens for 84 percent of chromosomal abnormalities seen in pregnancy. With test expansion, NIPT is starting to screen for the remaining 16% of other rare abnormalities. Let's review our current paradigm of prenatal screening and diagnostic testing. 
Prior to NIPT, screening and diagnostic options were only available in the first and second trimesters. Serum screening is available in the first trimester along with nuchal translucency and second trimester serum only. As we all know, diagnostic testing is available in the first trimester, which is chorionic villus sampling, and second trimester amniocentesis. NIPT is available across all these trimesters starting as early as 10 weeks. And as we move along in our discussion here today, it has a much higher detection rate and lower false positive rates compared to traditional screening. Also reduced exposure to the baby with diagnostic testing. So let's, take, let's look at the conventional prenatal screening options, detection rates for trisomy 21. You can see here on the slide, first trimester um, nuchal translucency ultrasound detects about 64 to 70% of Down syndrome. If we add serum blood screening to this, this increases to 82 to 87%. Triple screen, which we don't do in our group anymore, was around 69%. Then you have the quadruple screen, which detects about 81%. And then you have a combination of first and second blood serum collections with nuchal translucent ultrasound, and it, that picks up a little bit higher. But this is sort of inconvenient for the patient, coming in for multiple blood draws, going to a professional perinatologist to get a nuchal translucency ultrasound. And what we fail to remember that the false positive rate is 5%. If you have a high volume obstetric practice like we do at Sharpe Staley, we do see a lot of false positive, causing undue anxiety for the patient and a lot of stress for the office staff and the practitioner. So when you look at all these conventional, non-invasive prenatal screening options, they have a relatively poor detection rate for trisomy 21 individually. And combinations of these can increase a little bit above 90%. But there is a better way, and that is the focus of our talk today, and it is about NIPT, non-invasive prenatal testing, and we're going to we're going to talk about that revolution in the upcoming slides. But keep in mind the 5% false positive rate here with what we're doing as standard screening. So before we move on to NIPT, I just wanted to have a slide here about the diagnostic testing options. And even what we know as the gold standard is not 100% sensitive and specific. Additionally, there are risks of maternal infection, bleeding, fluid leakage, and fetal loss with these diagnostic invasive procedures. So let's compare this with NIPT. What are ob our objectives of NIPT? Before I go on here, um, a lot of you might have heard of NIPT, but I want to use other nomenclature just to make sure we're all talking about the same thing. Some purists call it NIPS, which is non-invasive prenatal screening, because it is a screening test. We have cell-free DNA and cell-free fetal DNA. I will be referring mostly to NIPT that's the nomenclature I like to use. But what are the objectives of NIPT? We want to reduce exposure of the fetus to any risk. This test can be easily offered to all pregnant women with a simple blood draw. We are going to reduce false positives, a lot of undue anxiety for our patients and um, giving them a better test. And we're going to enable a very high detection rate. So where does the cell-free DNA come from? Maternal blood contains both maternal and fetal cell-free DNA. I love this diagram here because it kind of shows where it comes from, in case people don't know. And 2 to 20% of the total cell-free DNA in maternal blood is placental. It is cytotrophoblastic, released into the bloodstream through apoptosis, which is known as cell death. It is detected after seven weeks gestation and undetectable within hours postpartum. So it is an ideal analyte for aneuploidy screening via NIPT. So how good is this approach? Let's go on to the evidence for NIPT performance. This slide represents a very uh, a updated meta-analysis, um, and they looked at 37 publications on NIPT detection of aneuploidies between 2011 and 2015. As you can see here, the detection rates and the false the detection rate is very high, and the false positive is very low compared to standard screening. Now, there are several technologies used for NIPT. Massively parallel sequencing, or what is known as MPS, is the most extensively published on. 
This slide illustrates the excellent test performance of NIPT via MPS. Dr. Gill and colleagues, as I said, looked at 37 different publications. What they found at the conclusion was that screening for trisomy 21 by analysis of cell-free DNA or NIPT in maternal blood is superior to all other traditional methods of screening with a higher detection rate and a lower false positive rate. So let's look at one of these studies that um, was in that 37 study meta-analysis. This is the CARE study, Comparison of Aneuploidy Risk Evaluation. What this slide illustrates is that the false positive rates are significantly lower with NIP versus what we're doing as standard screening. This was a prospective, a prospective trial, blinded, multi-center, 21 centers here in the United States. 1,914 women were enrolled. The mean age was 29.6. I point this out because initially NIPT came in for high-risk patients, 35 and older, but this, the mean age on this study was 29.6, singleton pregnancy, with a racial, uh, ethnically diverse population. So when we look here, the combined false positive rates for trisomy 21 and trisomy 18 is about 4.2% for standard screening versus 0.45% for NIPT. Let's keep this in mind as we move through the slides. So, and this is talking about the same study, NIPT versus standard screening. When you get a lower false positive rate, you're going to have a higher positive predictive value. So we, the positive predictive value for both uh, for NIPT with trisomy 21 and 18 and 13 is much higher than standard screening. So with a higher detection rate, lower fa false positive rate, you get a higher positive predictive value. Now a lot of people are like, ah, oh, what is this positive predictive value? <laughs> so I'm going to show a slide here. Just to remind everyone, what is the positive predictive value? When you have a positive test, you want to know what is the chance that this fetus is truly affected given a positive screen result. So for a test with a known sensitivity and specificity, you can project the positive predictive value for a specific population. With someone with, you know, a population with a known or estimated prevalence, example for maternal age. The prevalence of autosomal aneuploidies increases with maternal age and decreases throughout gestation because of spontaneous losses of aneuploidy fetuses. So positive predictive value, I like to look at the bottom half of the slide. Here we go with my, my point. Oh, my pointer's gone. <laughs> okay, here, right here. So what we're doing is true positives divided by true positives plus false positives to detect a positive predictive value. So what I'd like to point out here, after that study, the completion of the CARE study, updates were made to the analytics algorithm used for NIPT prenatal tests to reduce technical causes of false positives. So um, this, the test, basically the test subjects were reanalyzed on an improved platform. This table shows both false positive rates and positive predictive values and the reduction in the false positive cases following improved test algorithms led to increased positive predictive value for not only trisomy 13 from 25 to 50%, but an increased positive predictive value from 40 to 67% for trisomy 18, and an increased positive predictive value from 46 to, excuse me, 46% to 63% for trisomy 21. So, this is, a, this is a great improvement. So once again, what is the summary of all this, talking about all of this? High sensitivity and specificity for trisomy 21, 18, and 13 is a huge benefit to patients as a first-tier screen. Its use will result in fewer confirmatory invasive procedures. So you want to reduce the false positive and you have, want to have a higher positive predict, predictive value, which NIPT has shown in the general population. Let's review some society guidelines and what is our society saying about this test. Which patients can consider NIPT? All pregnant women can be offered the option of NIPT. Patients at high risk for aneuploidy and who are at high risk? This is when the test first came out. We looked at high risk for aneuploidy, maternal age-related risk, positive results on maternal serum screening, abnormal ultrasound findings, 
a history suggestive and increased risk for trisomy 21, trisomy 18, and trisomy 13, or sex chromosome aneuploidy, and parental translocation. But patients at low risk can be offered this for aneuploidy. We offer them now the standard screening, which has a higher false positive rate and causes more distress and anguish for the patient having to undergo genetic counseling, invasive testing, and here's a simple blood test that can be offered to the patient and decrease with a decreased false positive rate. Let's look at some of the summary of the society guidelines on NIPT. So all women should be offered the option of aneuploidy screening, including NIPT or diagnostic testing, regardless of age. ACOG came out with a statement that patients should be offered aneuploidy screening regardless of age. So a 22-year-old patient could ask for an amniocentesis. Um, if NIPT fails to give a result, alternate testing should be discussed with the patient because of the increased risk for aneuploidy. I'm not going to go into much detail here, but depending on the NIPT you choose to use, if there is no result, in my opinion, it does no favors to the patient to repeat the NIPT. That patient should be sent to a perinatologist, have genetic counseling, a level two ultrasound, because they may be at increased risk for aneuploidy and a discussion of invasive testing should be done. Now, false positives and false negatives do occur. So diagnostic testing should, should be offered to any patient with a positive NIPT result. A patient should not act on just a positive NIPT result. They should be offered good diagnostic testing if they have a positive result. Did I switch slides? Here we go. Yes, okay. And so here we have some society guidelines on NIPT in an all-risk population. The first one is, a, is what I've or, already previously mentioned in the slide before, but remember, all women should be offered the option of aneuploidy screening regardless of age. Now, there's increasing evidence to show that testing can also be applied to women with average risk. The following protocol options are currently considered appropriate. NIPT or cell-free DNA screening as a primary test offered to all pregnant women. And the clinical validation strongly suggested that NIPS or NIPT can replace conventional screening for trisomy 13, trisomy 18, and Down syndrome trisomy 21. Test metrics support NIPT across the maternal age spectrum. Practice implementation. So what do we do in our very busy obstetric practice? So the initial OB visit. So all pregnant women should be offered prenatal assessment for aneuploidy by screening or diagnostic testing options regardless of maternal age or other risk factors. And this ideally should be at the first obstetric visit, in my opinion. And we should go over the difference between screening and diagnostic testing. So what do we do in our practice? Our patients typically call in when they have a positive pregnancy test. Of course, some patients show up in the second or third trimester but the majority of women have a positive pregnancy test, call our office, and the ones that are familiar with our system understand that they are gonna be offered in the very first call to our call center a group visit. So we have an OBG, which is a group visit, where all newly pregnant patients can come in and hear a review, get a PowerPoint presentation of the prenatal screening and testing options. They gather literature, they get handouts, they see videos, they see how their prenatal care is going to go. But this is a great opportunity since now it has become so complex with all the various serum screenings and ultrasounds and coming at a certain gestational ages to have these patients come in and hear about this. And then they can think about when they come in for their first visit to see the doctor, which test they want to do. So when they come in to see the physician or the nurse practitioner, oh, and that talk, that PowerPoint presentation is done by one of our nurse practitioners and our various satellite sites, um, so it's convenient for the patient. So at the first visit, the transvaginal ultrasound is done to document fetal viability and dating. When you want to see the patient, you want to make sure you have the accurate dating in order to uh, go ahead with the screening test, and you want to make sure you have a viable fetus. You don't want to spend you know, 15, 20 minutes going over prenatal screening options when there's nothing to screen. So we always do the ultrasound first. Then we review if they've gone to the OB group visit, we review antibody screening, and they 
pretty much have made up their mind or may have a few questions um, regarding some of the testing, and we'll go over it at that appointment. And um, let's move on to the next slide. Yeah, so this is one of the slides that we show in our PowerPoint presentation, just to kind of, so the patients get a handout of this and they have all the tests listed there the diagnostic test versus the screening test, and during which gestational ages they need to have this done. Our nurses are very, um, the, are the ones that really sit with the patients and tell them go to the lab during this time period. They write the gestational weeks and the dates up on their um, lab slips. They're very helpful. Um, so what we want to hit home with the patients, um, that these are all screening tests. There is absolutely no risk to the fetus. These are blood draws or maybe a combination with ultrasound and blood draw. It explains to the patient that a negative screening test on any of these screening tests, which is the standard versus NIPT, none of them guarantee a baby without a birth defect since there are other reasons for birth defects. We explain defects exist that cannot be detected by screening. How many times do you have a patient come in for screening and they think that they're 100% guaranteed a perfect baby? That is not true, and you want to hit home what we're actually testing for. So there's no confusion. So what we do after all of that in the counseling pre and post, and we're going to go into the counseling a little more in some further slides, we have a prenatal testing consent form. We've listed every genetic testing option, invasive versus screening. The patients will initial um, whether they accept or decline the test, and then they will put their signature at the bottom and date it. This is a generic slide. We have ours with sharp. Um, information on it, but I just wanted a generic slide for this talk today. But this is a good thing to do because a lot of patients get confused or later on they may come back and say, oh, I wasn't offered this test or that test or an ultrasound. So this is a way to make sure that they understood what we taught them and what is, what is there for them to choose. So let's go into counseling considerations. So how do we counsel patients? How long does this take? Everyone, you know, is worried about how much time this is going to take. With our OB group visit, that cuts down on a lot of the time that we have to repeat ourselves to each individual patient. But let's go into pretest counseling considerations. You want to give your patients informed choice. You don't want to be directive of what, what, what test to choose. What the patient chooses is ultimately up to her. So you're going to do the typical things that you do in an obstetric visit. You're going to obtain history to determine optimal test offerings. You're going to get a maternal medical history, a pregnancy history, family history, carrier test results. Um, you're going to go over the benefits and limitations of the screening test versus the diagnostic test. You're going to review test performance. You can go into statistics, false positives, false negatives, what this means. And what are you going to do if you have an abnormal test? So, with NIPT, in my experience, you know, all this testing that I had to go over already took an, an, uh, an time. If they don't go to the group visit, it takes about anywhere from 10 to 20 minutes. Adding NIPT in there added maybe one or two minutes because it's just one more test that we have to review. And um, let's move on to the next slide. So what are the limitations of NIPT? Since I think this is a wonderful test, obviously every test has its limitations. So we want to make sure that people understand risk assessment is limited to specific fetal aneuploidies. This is not testing for everything under the sun. This is testing for specific fetal aneuploidies, trisomy 21, 18, 13, sex aneuploidies. So you want to get that across to the patient. No assay is 100% specific or 100% sensitive. And when you have a negative result, this does not eliminate the possibility of trisomy 13 trisomy 18, trisomy 21, or sex aneuploidies. So a negative test result does not eliminate that possibility. Also, it can be confined by placental mosaicism or fetal mosaicism may impact your results on an NIPT. And results may represent chromosomal changes from the mother, for example, maternal malignancy, mosaicism, or transplant. So there are some limitations. So what are you going to tell the patient after post-test counseling? You want, once again, you want to hit home. Only specific aneuploidies are tested through NIPT. These results are not 100%. We have false positives and false negatives. They're very, very rare, but they do happen. And you, once again, want to look at the complete clinical picture. For example, if your NIPT is negative, but you see multiple abnormalities on an ultrasound, the patient may still need invasive testing, microarray, 
and further testing. So you want to look at the whole clinical picture, as always, as we do in obstetrics and as physicians. Um, Post-test counseling, what do we do after an abnormal result, okay? Always remember, with an abnormal result on NIPT, you want to refer the patient to have a level two ultrasound, genetic counseling, we refer them to a perinatologist and offer amniocentesis or CVS if they're early enough. Um, other counseling and management considerations depend on various clinical and medical issues. Once again, the patient's history, gestational age, and ultrasound. Some patients decline invasive testing, so maybe getting them a level two ultrasound and seeing a perinatologist is reassuring enough for them. So let's talk about some provider and patient resources, places you can go. You're not going to learn everything from this talk today, so let's see where we can go to get some information. This is a great site, um, GEM, Prenatal Genetic Testing. They have information for the physicians and clinicians, the patient, the practice site can go into it, laboratory, there's videos, glossary of terms, explanation of screening tests, even values calculator, and a lot that is here. You do have to pay for access for this site, so some people are deterred because they don't want to pay for access. But another wonderful site is the AJOG NIPT Resource Center. Um, here there are short counseling videos, interactive case studies. You can go to a list of peer-reviewed journal articles cross-indexed with PubMed. I personally have gone to this site. I've done the um, case studies and looked at the short counseling videos. Um, as you all know, and I'm sure you're doing electronic medical record, in our exam rooms we have computers in every single exam room. So sometimes I'll pull up a video for a patient if they're waiting while I'm trying to see another patient. So I think this is a great site. I think everyone should go to that. And I think somewhere on, one of, on the screen the link is there. I think the link for the NIPT Resource Center is showing up there. I don't see it, but we'll get it to all of you. Uh, not a problem. Let's see here. Now, let's talk about reimbursement. A lot of, um, often reimbursement and lack of insurance coverage is considered to be one of the primary barriers to offering NIPT to all patients. These next few slides will share some information on the changing landscape of coverage in the United States for NIPT coverage. First, this slide shows some of the payers that consider NIPT medically necessary for all patients. So here are some of the insurance companies that are covering for average risk patients. This map shows coverage by Blue Cross Blue Shield plans, one of the largest insurance companies in the nation. At this time, plans in the majority of states cover NIPT for all patients. Some, some states are still lagging, but hopefully over time this will change. Let's look at the Medicaid landscape. So even coverage by Medicaid is showing progress. Medicaid in all but 16 states cover NIPT in high-risk patients. And we expect to see additional states covering NIPT coverage for all-risk patients in the near future. Part of this is in thanks to the Coalition for Access to Prenatal Screening, or what is known as CAPS. It's an organization comprised by Illumina, Natera, Council, Progenity, and Integrated Genetics. CAPS aims to encourage reimbursement coverage policy changes, as NIPT has the potential to improve personalized patient care and save healthcare dollars downstream. Um, with that 5% false positive rate, there are a lot of women that had to go under invasive testing, which is a lot of healthcare dollars. So hopefully this will, this will change the landscape. And um, another wonderful site for NIPT reimbursement and also other frequently asked questions is a, the Illumina website. The Illumina website offers answers, uh, answers to frequently asked questions by your patients and even about reimbursement. So this is a great um, site to also go to. Um, so I'm going to take questions in a minute, but just to summarize, we have a test here that has a lower false positive rate, a much higher detection rate than what we're offering in standard screening today. Remember, our patients come first, and the patients, um, they have so much anxiety when they get a, fal a false positive for down screening on a quadruple screen or a serum integrated screen. You know, recently, recently I've had two patients, one that did first trimester screening with NT, she had a positive downs, um, and she called the office 
five times in one day, you know, the staff, call the staff, everything that got done once she had her testing, the baby was fine, the baby was normal. So probably if she had picked NIPT, we could have avoided all of this undue stress and anxiety for this poor patient and also for the office staff and the provider. This is a great test. I really hope more people will start implementing this, incorporating this into their paradigm to offer it to all patients um, because it, it, it's far better than what we're offering in standard screening. Um, so now we'll take some questions. Okay, thank you. So I, I'm, I, this is Patty back again. I'm sorting through some of the questions, um, and we do have a number of them coming in. So if we're not able to get to your question during the time we have left, we will make sure that we follow up with you um, through email. Um, I am seeing a question regarding reimbursement. I'm asking if it's fully reimbursed or partially reimbursed. And so I just want to make it very clear that um, no one company can really address the reimbursement question um, universally for all patients. It's very dependent on the patient's particular insurance carrier plan, um, what carve-outs may be present in that particular plan, whether the patient has met deductible or not, if there's a co-insurance or things like that. So questions um, regarding how reimbursement will work for a particular patient is really left up, um, is really left best asked to that particular insurance carrier directly. All right, um, so we have a couple of questions that are all sort of along the same vein, Dr. Ziania, talking about um, recommend, so ACOG, whether it does or doesn't specifically recommend NIPT for all patients. So we have one that says it doesn't specifically recommend it. How do you address which test you recommend when talking to your patients? And another one saying, when do you expect it to recommend NIPT for all patients? Okay, I mean, for with our with our medical group, um, you know, we're we're a little bit different in San Diego. We are heavily weighted HMO, so um, in our group, but we also take PPO insurances. Um, for the NIPT, we for high risk patients, 35 and older, or previous history, abnormal ultrasound finding, our HMO pays for the NIPT testing to be done for all those patients. The patients under 35. We still do offer this test because we want to make it aware, make patients aware that this test is out there. We don't want someone saying they weren't office, offered this test and then they have a fetal abnormality. Um, so we offer it to all patients, just as, as we counsel a 22-year-old that there's diagnostic testing options with CVS and amniocentesis. Most patients don't choose that. And yes, in your counseling, you could you know, somewhat direct them. Um, but what I have to say about NIPT, people get to find out the sex of their baby very early. And I think a lot of patients are attracted to this versus the genetic um, testing that it does. So even patients, they will check with their insurance companies. Um, and a lot of times if they have a deductible, they're going to hit their deductible at the hospital when they go into childbirth. So they will find out what their deductible is and then what they may have to reimburse or what they may have to pay out of pocket for NIPT. And I would say that some patients choose to go ahead and pay out of pocket, or some of the providers cover NIPT fully, and they tell me, oh, it was covered fully. So we don't really look at insurance. We just we counsel the patient to let her know what all her options are, and then we leave the ultimate decision to the patient, leaving insurance out of it, because that is a kind of you know sticky situation, and we can't tell them what every provider, what every insurance company, if they're going to pay or not pay, that would take a lot of time from our office staff. So we leave it for the patient to look into about reimbursement, and then they'll decide whether they want to move forward with the test. Did I answer your question? <laughs> Wait, yeah, and I think, I think that that's just, a, as I said, now we, I see a number of questions about reimbursement coming in, so we're just, we're, we're not going to spend any more time on that. That's really something that specifically needs to be addressed between the patient doctor and the insurance company. Um, I was hoping, so in part of your answer, though, you, you brought up, um, Another question that came up, but let's address the ACOG question first. So we have a couple okay. questions along the same vein in that thing that the ACOG bulletin doesn't specifically recommend NIPT for all women. So when you counsel, how do you, do you decide to recommend a test? Um, are you offering these tests and letting the patient choose? 
And then another follow-up question to that is, when do you think that ACOG will recommend NIPT for all pregnancies? I think it's, it's an interesting question, right? So it, the bulletin right. says that it's an available option for all patients, but it doesn't specifically recommend one test over the other. So how do you handle that in your practice? Yeah, it's, you know, ACOG gives us guidelines, and they do give some recommendations. It's really ultimately up to the practitioner, to the provider, doctor, nurse practitioner, physician assistant, and their patient. Um, you know, when I counsel a patient, I say, you know, NIPT is new to the, to the stream of tests that you have. Um, it may or may not cover, be covered by insurance. I want you to know this test is available. Patients come in and sort of already know about this test. A lot of our patients are very educated. They come in asking for the test. So we don't, in our group, we've decided we're such a large multi-specialty group. We don't want patients coming back and saying, oh, I wasn't offered this test or I wasn't offered this test. Maybe we have more high-maintenance patients. But I feel like the patients need to have all of their options given to them, and then ultimately they choose. I don't really get into ACOG and what ACOG recommends. I mean, um, obviously I follow those guidelines. I practice, we practice by the book, and we follow guidelines and things like this. But we, um, you know, this test is out there. Patients know about it. Um, we're giving them a choice. So ultimately, whether they choose the test or choose to do a quadruple screen or a serum integrated screening or sequential screening, it's really up to them and to their insurance uh, carrier or if they want to pay for it if it's not covered. So, um, the, you know, the test is out there. I don't think we shouldn't be at least telling our patients about it. It's a much better test. It has a lower false positive rate, um, you know, better predictive value than what we're offering the patients now. We've been do the, the standard screening we've been doing for years, and we're, it doesn't detect as high as NIPT. So uh, I can, I'm going to go into an example. I had a patient in 2011 that had a positive Down syndrome screening with a um, serum integrated screening. This caused her so much distress. She went through amniocentesis. The baby was normal. The baby delivered. It was normal. And so when she came back later in 2014, pregnant again, she didn't want any type of testing. And she was, uh, I, she was I don't want to go through any testing because I don't want to go through that again. And I'm sure my baby's fine. And I counseled her about NIPT and how it's changed and what the false positive rate is and the detection rate. So she decided to choose NIPT, and, you know, and she was so much happier doing that because everything came back negative. She got to find out the sex of the baby earlier, and she didn't have to go through all of that, all of the, um, what she had to go through with the first pregnancy. So I see it in patients, um, and maybe because we have such a high volume, we see more false positives than other smaller groups, but it is really positively impacted, you know, our patients, and I think it's a better test. And I'm not saying that we ram NIPT down everyone's throat. It's just we offer it as a choice, and then they decide what they want to proceed with. Did that answer your question, Patty? <laughs> yes, it does. And when you were initially talking about um, reimbursement and, and how patients come in and they, they know about NIPT and they request it and that you think that some of that has to do with them wanting to know the sex of the baby, um, one of our viewers had a, had a question about how do you best emphasize the serious nature of NIPT to patients who are primarily interested in it to find out the sex of the baby? Yes. I mean, you know, obviously um, I have a very good rapport with my patients, and I may laugh and say, yes, I know you want to do your gender reveal party or you want to find out the sex of the baby, but that's not really what this test is for. We're trying to make sure that your baby is nor normal, doesn't have a chromosomal abnormality, and I review what we're testing for, trisomy 21, trisomy 18, trisomy 13. And these, you know, are serious conditions that we're testing for. And patients understand that. I also go ahead and I say, you know, if we get a negative result, it's not 100% guaranteed that the baby doesn't have one of these conditions. And this is a very serious test. And most patients, they, they accept that and understand that. But they're still happy to find out the sex of the baby really early, I guess, you know. These gender reveal parties are now, uh, I, didn't, I, I, didn't, I didn't have one of those, but I think it's important. But I do stress the importance of what NIPT is testing for, and it's not just for the sex of the baby. Okay. Um, I'm seeing a couple questions asking about NIPT for twins, um, so I can just quickly answer those. Yes, um, there are um, laboratories that provide NIPT for twins. Um, there may be some differences in, in um, how that information is reported, so it's best to check with whatever laboratory you're using. 
Um, as far as Illumina, our microdeletion testing is not available for twins. That is something that is just for singletons. Um, Dr. Zania, another one for you. Um, a question about how do you feel that NIPT results are best given to patients? Um, is this something like with um, serum screen results, you could have you simply have a phone call and say your results were, were normal or positive? Um, do you prefer patients to come in person? Do you send them the results in the mail? How does your practice address that? Um, our practice is um, doing NIPT through a company called Council. So the patients get a card with a login number and they can actually go to the website and find out the test results before they get back to us. So most patients have already looked at their test results. They have genetic counselors on site that if there's a positive result, they can call and talk to them directly. Um, but we, when we do get the test result, we know the patient's already seen it, um, but when they come into the appointment, their next appointment, we review, oh, your NIPT results were negative. Do you have any questions about this? Once again, this doesn't, doesn't guarantee that the baby doesn't have one of these conditions, but it's 99% accurate here, and we're very happy with these results. Do you have any specific questions? And we answer it at that time. So we do address it. We don't just you know, have them log in and never speak to them about it again. So there is a post-test counseling, but it's done more face-to-face. -face. Um, if we have a positive result, we do call them because they're going to be upset, and um, even though they have access to a genetic counselor and we explain to them, that they're going to see our high-risk uh, MFM, our perinatologists, get genetic counseling and um, be offered uh, amniocentesis um, versus CVS, and we explain what those procedures are. And we've touched on those procedures in the, in the first appointment, so they're not shocked when they go in. Um, and so, yeah, we, we, we do a follow-up call if their appointment's not in three weeks if there's a positive result. But for a negative, they just look and then we kind of mention, uh, review it at the next appointment and see if they have any questions. Okay. Um, there was a question about can you use NIPT to replace first and second trimester chemical screening? Um, so again, I think that um, one of our goals for this presentation was to help um, have viewers understand that, that NIPT is a, a superior screening option to these traditional serum screenings. So we would want to make sure that there's an understanding that you would not want to do NIPT and then follow up with a quad screen or anything like that. So um, as Dr. Zania explained and as she showed with her consent form, you're really wanting patients to decide one or the other when it comes to these screening and you're not going to want to layer a whole bunch of different screening tests on top of one another. Yes, exactly, Patty. Um, we do have patients that get confused when they go to the OBG screen and see all of this, and that's why we have the consent form. A lot of times some patients will come in and say, I want all of it. I want everything. <laughs> and so we have to take time with those patients and explain, you're, you know, you're not going to get an NIPT if you sign up for an amniocentesis. If you are going to do the quadruple marker or the serum integrated, you're not going to get, we explain you're going to do one or the other, and we go through that. So that's more, you know, face-to-face -face with the patient. I mean, not all patients say that, but some patients want everything done because I think they're just confused and want to test their baby every which way. But it's, that's not appropriate. Uh, it's a waste of health care dollars, and it could be confusing or conflicting results. So, You mentioned a story about a patient that you had where she had, um, she had you know, screening in her previous pregnancy, and it, it wasn't a, a good experience for her. One of our questions um, from one of our viewers is, um, for patients that have, have chosen NIPT versus other screening testing options, um, do they all have a similar positive experience? Um, what do they typically come back and say to you once they've had, had that screening in the pregnancy? Well, I think what uh, patients like, I mean, we're all busy. Patients are busy. They have, you know, jobs and things to go to. So when you do uh, some of these other screening or uh, the serum integrated or sequential integrated, you, you have patients coming back between certain gestational ages for the first blood draw. They got to go, you know, get their NT before the cutoff. They have to come back and do another blood draw. So there's several steps into getting one of these results. I think what people, what patients, at least my patients like about NIPT, is just one blood draw. And they're still going to get an anatomy ultrasound at 18 to 20 weeks. So I know some people say, well, it's a nuchal translucency. People are picking, picking up cystic hygroma and things early on. But that's a lot of healthcare dollars, especially in our group. We don't want every patient going to the perinatologist to get an NT screening. So I think patient like, patients like the convenience of one blood draw 
and um, you know, we explain that this is the fetal DNA that we're testing and we're looking for these conditions. I, I think convenience is what patients like and of course they like the fact that they find out the baby sex early on. Um, we do do anatomy screen 18 to 20 weeks and then uh, the California screening program, everyone is a little different per state. Um, they do follow up uh, for neural tube defect, one more blood draw after 15 weeks. It's optional. Some patients choose to do this, some patients don't because they've already had, they were going to do their anatomy scan and that's going to be picked up that way. But I think the convenience of the simple blood draw and getting the results early on and um, we have had patients choose CVS because they've had their blood draw at 10 weeks and they get a positive result and they go with a CVS. So it's and it helps with pregnancy planning or if they choose not to continue in the pregnancy. Patty? Okay. <laughs> Thank Any you. Other questions? Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. I was distracted okay. getting some questions. So um, okay. again, we have we have great um, great viewer questions coming in and I am trying to see I can be grouping them into the, the best um, options to try to maximize the number that we can answer. So there's, again, a couple more questions about um, how your practice is addressing abnormalities, um, both either from ultrasound abnormalities or, or, in, or uh, NIPT positive results. So there is one question about ultrasound structural abnormalities. Um, and, you know, certainly, as you said, you follow guidelines. We recommend following guidelines as well. And if there is an abnormal ultrasound, um, patients should really be um, offered the option for diagnostic testing. Um, certainly, we know that there are many reasons that uh, there could be a fetal ultrasound abnormality outside of amyploidy, particularly common amyploidy, which NIPT screens for. Um, so we, we want to make sure that um, we are not seeing anything that's in contradiction to those good medical practice guidelines. Um, there are a couple other questions then about, you know, what do you, how, could you talk a little bit more about um, when you are talking about an abnormality with a patient, um, you know, do you talk about malignancies with every patient that has an abnormal? You know, how are you addressing those particular um, conversations? Um, with an abnormal, luckily I, I have not had a lot of abnormal results. Maybe we want to go into this, but I, you know, I did have a patient that had an abnormal NIPT. Um, she was positive at um, all three. Trisomy 13, 18, and 21, and so yes, I did talk to the patient about potential for maternal malignancy. She was a you know 39 year old patient. She had no other issues. Um, she did complain about a little bit of you know rectal bleeding. She thought it was a hemorrhoid from her last pregnancy, but we did a full workup on her, and you know I, I had the talk with her. She came into the office, and she did a CVS early on. The baby was a normal girl. And we did a full workup, and we, found, we diagnosed the patient with rectal cancer. So yes, and that, that is an NIPT that sticks out. That's not the norm, but the majority of my NIPT results are luckily normal, because 95, you know, 95 to 97% of babies are normal. So it's a small subsect of women that have the abnormal result. But we don't just take on the abnormal results as a general obstetrician gynecologist. We have a perinatologist that we um, primarily send all our patients to with any abnormal ultrasound finding. They get genetic counseling. They're offered CVS and amniocentesis. I mean, we follow the normal guidelines. We don't just stop at NIPT. If NIPT is negative and we find something else, we follow up on that. That's what you should do as an obstetrician. Yeah, and I'd just like to add to that, too, for that particular question. What our experiences in the laboratory has been is that, you know, certainly these cases of malignancy um, are very interesting, and they tend to get a little bit of a spotlight when it comes to presentations or publications and things like that. And I think it's important to remember that these are incredibly rare. And as Dr. Ziania said, these are not ones that would be your typical um, positive for a trisomy 21, positive for a trisomy 13. Usually there are multiple things that are different or unusual about the results of those particular samples. And so, um, again, th these are very, very rare. Um, in the presence of, of hundreds of thousands of other samples. So, you know, hopefully this would not be something that um, you would need to, to spend a lot of time about worrying about when you're implementing this in a, in a general OB practice. Yes. Um, okay. So another positive at like, oh, oh, go ahead. <laughs> no, go ahead. 
Now, I was going to say, I mean, if it's positive for trisomy 21, you're going to look at the patient's age, and obviously you're going to forward, you know, send them on to a perinatologist for genetic counseling and level 2 ultrasound. You're, you don't need to talk to that patient about a malignancy. I mean, that, that is rare. That's usually the patient's going to have trisomy 21, or hopefully she's lucky and it's a false positive. But the false positives are so rare compared to standard screening. When I get someone for standard screening, I'm, I tell the patient, there's a high chance that this baby is normal. Let's not panic until we need to panic. So, you know, I'm sorry to go off on that one maternal malignancy one, but that's where she was positive at all three, and so that's rare. So if you're positive at trisomy 21, 18, and 13, there could be something going on with the mother. You don't want to scare patients and talk about malignancy if it's just positive at trisomy 21. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Okay. We had a couple questions about the group counseling, um, and in particular, yeah. is that something that you're able to bill for as well? Um, the, we, our billing is is global. I don't, you know, I, I know states vary on that, but um, we we don't get paid until the baby is delivered, so that's part of the global package. We'll put in a charge, but it usually comes up as um, zero RVU, and it's just like a typical prenatal visit. So. Um, all the prenatal visits in our group are zero RVU, zero billing until the patient actually delivers. Some people have a high deductible, so they pay that up front, um, and then we collect on the back end, so it's different. So we don't charge patients separate cash for that group visit. So that's just part of their OB package, um, OB group care. Okay. Mm -hmm. One final question for you. Um, how do you see NIPT being used in regular OB care one year from now? And then a follow-up to that as you're thinking about that answer is, is where do you see it in three years from now? Mm -hmm. Well, I hope, I hope one year from now that um, it's in, you know, being used in most office, offices and offered to patients because it's a much better um, test than what we're doing in standard screening. So hopefully more OB practices will be offering to the, to the patients. Maybe the people that had the questions about ACOG, maybe they'll come out uh, with a, a more clear recommendation for them. Um, also, you know, here in California, you know, we're using um, serum screening and also NT, and we're hoping that down the road, um, NIPT is what is used as the first tier screening. Maybe that would happen in three years from now. And three years from now, maybe some test expansion where we can, you know, test for single genes like cystic fibrosis and other things um, with test expansion. And if more people start using this test and in the general population, hopefully the cost will come down some and it'll be available to all women all, all across the globe or United States or the world. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I want to direct everyone's attention that we did get that web link. Uh, Dr. Daniel mentioned it during her presentation um, for the American Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology um, NIPT Resource Center. So you can see um, below where the slides are, there should be a link for that. Again, this is an online, online resource center. Um, it has um, a lot of great information um, for self-directed learning. So we would, uh, we would highly encourage you to check that out um, if you have additional questions about NIPT. Um, otherwise, I'd like to again thank Dr. Tina Ziania for being with us today to go over this important topic, and I'd like to thank all of you for joining us um, and taking time out of your busy days. Hope everyone has a great rest of the day. Thank you.